I enjoyed batting. You know, I didn't, I didn't enjoy watching people bat. I enjoyed being out there and performing. You know, if we're gonna bat for five sessions, why, why don't I bat for the five sessions? Whenever the captain wants to declare, that's when I'm supposed to be walking off the field, putting my bat under my arm. The legacy I felt I, I left is the fact that I entertained. If I had my last dollar to pay to watch someone bat, I'd watch Brian Lara bat. I love Brian Lara. But no matter where you bowled, no matter who you bowled, no matter where you put the field, he could manipulate the ball and score runs. You always just felt that you bowled your best delivery and he could still find a way to put that away. Brian Lara was the one who would give you the, the most pleasure to watch. He's a bit of a genius. I mean, you can't be scoring those kind of runs in international cricket. I don't understand a thing or two about batting. On this day when he's playing well, there's nothing better to watch. Amazing player, you know, Glenn McGrath could bowl the best possible ball and Lara we could just smash it through there or you get inside it and flick it over here and you think, this is unbelievable. This is a different league altogether. He's, he's easily one of the best in the world, without a doubt. He's just incredible to watch. His father was a frustrated cricketer himself. He wanted to um, do as much as he could to make Brian a, 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 a real star. And he used to drive him all over Trinidad to coaching events and uh, uh, matches. The family all mucked in. We went on to Trinidad one year, um, 1985 or 86, for a youth tournament. And um, there was talk about a, a very young, very diminutive left-hander who was scoring a lot of runs in, in their junior cricket in Trinidad. Um, actually saw him play for the first time against us. He got a, a good half century um, in the game against Jamaica. The first time I played against him was in 1988, Leeward Islands versus Trinidad. He was a young man then. and. I think he scored 48 against us, and you could see the potential. Yeah, I remember we came back from a tour in Pakistan, and I saw, I was told about this young son, I saw him in Trinidad, and you know, just seeing him in the nets one day, he was just knocking, and you could see that there was something special about him. As a youngster, Brian Charles Lara's reputation went before him, but he really made a name for himself in 1988, aged just 18. He scored 98 against Barbados, the likes of the Joel Garners and the Michael Marshalls and stuff. So. That, that was no mean feat. To score 92 as a young man against Barbados, that's about 150 normally. Somebody walked from the top of the stands and sort of gave us some lip. Uh, two West Indian fast bowlers and a little young fella. Look, two, you can't get him out. The team media lasted about two minutes, and next morning, out back pad, and that was the end of it. But he, he, he had some ability from, from very early. Called up for the tour of Pakistan in 1990, Lara was already being touted as a star for the future. Well, I remember that tour in Pakistan, Malka was teasing him that you know, he's not going to get any runs with the, with the bat being so high up in the air, and you know, I think he's probably trying to prove Malcolm wrong as well in terms of that was his technique, that was his style. Lara was a force of nature, really. He, you look at him at the crease, he'd, he'd move around a bit, he had this high back lift, slightly crouched stance, not obviously or immediately a recipe for success. And then you'd see him lace one through point before the fielder had moved, and, and you realise this was a special talent. Brian Lara's grip was a little odd, but essentially he's a very good technical player, but he had a gift that not many players have. There are lots of players who are, who are good technically, um, who will get runs, but he had the ability to take the game away from you, uh, the ability to score uh, more quickly than, than you wanted to as a captain, he had a kind of touch of genius that not many players have. 
The West Indies side of the early 90s was at a crossroads. With the likes of Viv Richards recently retired, the Caribbean craved a new superstar. In just his fifth test against Australia in January 1993, Lara became that star. We got a Shane Warne, and these guys are top bowlers, top of the tree. So Brian Lara, the young man, first trip to Australia as an international cricketer. Josh. It was his first test home good. Uh, and I think he, he sort of set the tone for the rest of his career and uh, when, when he got to 100, he, he went big. And it was just vintage brand. He had that hear about him, that cockiness where he wants to do well and he wants to sort of get his name up here and he, he, he wanted to be rated amongst the best. Yeah. It is. Takes him to 200. John Bradman said that uh, it was probably the greatest uh, innings he'd ever watched, and the Australians loved him after that. That really catapulted him to stardom straight away. He really batted well. We started thinking, you know, this guy could bat for a whole week. The innings was just a gem to be a part of, to see, to witness. That 277 was, to me, was something special. Oops, he's in trouble. Ah! And he got run out eventually, but that really kicked out his career, really. I never looked back since. The West Indies won the series 2-1, but with the exception of Lara, there was no longer the seamless transition of young players coming through. The glory years for West Indies cricket were coming to an end. The team was weakening. I think he felt this is not going to last forever. I think we all knew it wouldn't, honestly. I mean, you've got to replace those players irreplaceable. We rely heavily on him to produce. We have to keep talking to Brian, you're the key man here. You stay here and you score some runs, guys will bat around you and we get a decent score. You get out cheaply, it could be a different ball game. Brian was always under tremendous pressure. If he's due to feel that if he doesn't get a big one or if he doesn't do well, the team might you know, struggle around him. So he was always under pressure to try to perform. And as his career progressed, it became increasingly clear that West Indies weren't going to be the team that they'd, they'd once been, and it was essentially down to Lara, to a lesser extent, Shivnery and Chanderpaul, who's still around, uh, to carry them. And, and West Indies lost a lot of games, but they won a lot of friends because everyone liked watching Brian Lara back. The 1994 visit of England saw Lara perform to even greater levels. The second test in Guyana was won, thanks to his splendid 167. And the series was comfortably won by the final test in Antigua. But injuries to Haynes and Richardson meant the West Indies needed a leader, and Lara delivered. I remember saying to Courtney and the coach, Warren Canai, guys, this is a very, very flat track. We already won the series 3-1. I think we should play for some records. I played a lot against Brian in youth cricket, so I knew him quite well, and I just knew he was a genius. When he puts his mind to something, he has this on-off switch, when he's got a point to prove, um, he will prove that point. We've noticed his sort of playing technique. Then time the, the team runs into early trouble, Brian seems to come to the floor a lot more hungry. And we had lost two early wickets in, in that particular morning. Once he got going, then you know that the runs are going to flow. and there's nothing Athos could do that day. He'd move the field one way and Brian would just take the mickey out of him and hit him there and Athos would move the field back and he'd hit it where he's just moved from. Once we won the toss and batted, everybody said, on this track, if Brian gets going, Jordan and I was saying he could score 400. We had four runs on over at the time um, and he finished the first day, I think, 100 and something, not all. And Everybody did the math, 90 overs in a day times four. If he scores three quarters of those runs, he'll have the record. Gary Sober's world record of 365 against Pakistan had stood since 1958. At the end of the first day, Lara remained unbeaten on 164. 24 hours later, he was on 320, just 45 short of the record. He loves his golf. 
and he went very early to, to hit on golf balls. And I ran into him and I looked at him in a kind of way like, why are you doing up so early? You should be home resting, focusing on getting some runs, you know? So I looked at him and I didn't say anything. He just said to me, big fella, don't worry. I'm going to get a big one for you. Just to witness the type of hitting that he played. I mean, he took all the England bowlers to the players. It was that desire to want to get that record personally, which I think drove him on. Um, and, and if you're in the same team, it's a good thing as far as I'm concerned. I've never played in a game where a bloke had got 300, so that was just amazing. It was just a joy for us to watch. After 12 hours and 46 minutes at the crease, Brian Lara eventually fell for 375. At 24, he became a superstar of cricket overnight with his pick of playing opportunities. Fortunately for English county cricket side Warwickshire, he was already lined up to play for them. Dermot Reeve was taking over, and Dermot had gone for an all-rounder called Manoj Prabhaka from India. And, uh, you know, some of us thought we should have perhaps had a batsman, but Dermot fair dues, wanted an all-rounder, so that's who we signed originally. He got injured, and we could see that uh, he wasn't going to be able to play for us. So England were in the West Indies. Mike Smith was, was um, manager of the tour, uh, and he was um, chairman of Warwickshire at the time as well. And we said, uh, try and sign Brian Lara. Brian does these sort of amazing things out in the Caribbean. I think he got 100 and lots in the first test when Mike rang up and said, this guy's something special. And when he came to Warwickshire, you know, he just oozed class. I mean, he was, he was different league. Lara's first four matches garnered 675 runs and five centuries. In his sixth match, however, he moved to another level. It was a dead game against Durham. And we, we, we were going to bat all day. And I, he went in at lunchtime, so I'm told, and uh, said, look, we're not declaring, are we? I can, I can get the world back. I think he was dropped on 39 by Chris Scott, the Durham wicketkeeper, who famously said, oh, he's probably going to go on and make 100 now. I was at my desk, and uh, the, wicket, the wicket was just uh, right in front of my office. And I kept looking up, oh, he's got 100. And I carried on doing something. Oh, he's got 200. Oh, he's got 300. I suddenly decided that I've got to watch then. He made 500, uh, and, and that just summed up the appetite the guy had. 